none of us in the shop actively enjoy the product. We are not we're not keeping them for ourselves. We're not investing in them ourselves. And uh, we definitely don't encourage people to buy them either. Hey everyone, welcome to Campbell's Coins. I had a lot of people asking for part two of my interview with my LCS, Avenue Coin. So here it is. If you didn't catch part one, I highly recommend it. If you didn't see it, we discussed selling gold and the best ways to go about it. We also discussed a video released by Silver Seeker, and we're gonna go over that a little bit more in this video too. Grab a cold beverage, sit back, and enjoy. So in the video that I had sent you, the Silver Seeker video, you mentioned something that was really interesting to me, and that was about the purity. So what can you tell us about the purity concept in terms of selling three nines fine versus four nines fine gold coins? Uh, let's see here. The, the Canadian, Royal Canadian Mint started doing a, the gold maple leaf in 1979. It was triple nine fine. Uh, before that, the Krugerrand was down. It was not 999 gold at all. This is, you know, so the Canadian Maple Leaf was first on scene right. for a, for a, for a one-ounce pure gold bullion item. Um, and then after only a few years, they were able to, you know, add an extra layer of confidence. And in 1982, they decided to put, you know, four nines purity on the, on the Maple Leafs. Realistically, there's virtually no difference for like 100% of folks investing in metal. Um, you're still getting an ounce, a one troy ounce of pure gold with both items. They both weigh the same on the scale. And all of our electronic equipment we use to test those two items would return the exact same search results, really. That's only important on huge grand scales like when when you have countries to countries that are having these weird goofy agreements which is just eyewash on paperwork for the most part oh kind of like the, um, the latest china and uh, australia yeah, mix up china thing which uh, i mean from what i understood perth mint still delivered 999 gold to them that was the correct weight uh, there's more to the story that i haven't you know had the chance to dig in but right it could just be headline, just a shock and awe campaign, like most of what we hear. I really don't know. Yeah, it seems um, it seems really interesting how they're nitpicking now. Yeah, yeah, they're really nitpicky about that. Just like I said, it could be just more optics, you know, for some other crazy event to happen with them. Um, but yeah, basically, if you know if precious metals are offered, you know, if someone's offered like an old triple nine fine maple leaf for a slight discount i say go for it there's nothing wrong with those coins you know they just trade a little bit closer to spot that's all sometimes that's what people want and you're buying those three nines fine maples for less than you would buy the four nines fine is that correct correct i think there there seems to be like right now i think there might be about a 15 to 25 dollar difference from okay. one product to the other and that's on both sides of the transaction. So if we're selling them, you know, we'd sell the, the triple nine for about 20 bucks less. And if we're buying them, we'd buy it for about 20 bucks less. So it goes back to the old adage, we have the same margin of what the product is. Right, right. And that that's what I find kind of interesting, though, because you mentioned the Krugerrand. And the Krugerrands are, are very, very popular, but they're not, they're 92% pure uh 91.7 if you want to get nitpicky the right. gold eagles same thing but the gold eagles will also sell more than that that three nines fine maple leaf which i just find it's, it's just it's so curious how certain products are are looked at and how others are kind of like thrown to the wayside even though it's still it's gold right you got the you got the slight premium difference across the board um Years ago, when I was learning the industry, I remember it used to be, okay, gold maple leaves, gold Krugerrands, you know, gold kangaroos, or whatever they have, Philharmonics, all of them are worth about the same. They all have about the same premium. And then gold eagles, or and at that time gold buffalo was still kind of new, those had a slightly higher premium. 
and then uh, of course one ounce bars you know more more plain or or a generically issued one ounce gold would trade a little bit under let's say maple leaves and krugerrands mm-hmm. so it's kind of like three different price points is what i remember from years ago and then just in these last few years i mean we've started noticing a little bit more variation in that i know that the gold bars is a big segment there seems to be quite a, a difference in spread from one one ounce gold bar to another especially when you throw in uh, pamp swiss into the mix they seem to have two products right now that are competing with each other it's really interesting yeah uh, especially if they're coming from like the same same place <laughs> Yeah, it's it's really interesting, you know. And that same thing with Royal Canadian Mint, right? They issue the 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 commonly traded one ounce gold maple leaf, which is a four nine four nine gold coin. But they've also created this other series, and it's, it has the animals on it. Um, and oh. they have a five nine purity. Yeah, the call the wild series. Right, right. It's interesting. They, you know, they issue them individually, caps encapsulated inside of like a larger, uh, like a stiff cardboard kind of package. It's like an oversized assay card. If anyone's familiar with one ounce gold bars, it's like twice the size of that. Yeah, I'll, I'll throw up an image so people see what we're talking about here. It's a really, uh, it's a really neat looking coin, and also the gold color. You wouldn't think that that extra nine would do something, but that it just has like an extra velvety yellow to it. It's pretty cool. It's really interesting. And it, again, for people who really like like that item, go for it. It's fine. And a lot of times you shop your LCS because it's not really a mainstream item. Sometimes you might get a good deal on one of those. Mm-hmm. Be, because of its nature, it doesn't... It's not always the most popular. It's not always the first thing to be sold off the shelf. So sometimes, like, we would actually discount that item. It sounds funny. It sounds ridiculous. But I, I remember over the years, a lot of times, those those 5.9, we call them 5.9 maples, even though they're not a maple leaf. <laughs> um, that's just short-term lingo, right? Yeah. But uh, a lot of times, we'd sell them for almost the same that we would sell one of those triple nine fine maple leaves or scratch maple leaves for that's really interesting because you you would think you're paying less for the three nines fine maple versus the four nines fine maple you would think maybe the five nines fine called the wild series you know you're you're getting a little bit more than then possibly the buffalo but it's a it's a very niche subject very niche type of coin and you you have to find a buyer for it and unfortunately like not everyone's into those Right. Popularity of a product seems to play a huge role in, you know, like, well, for example, what we would be willing to pay for that item. You know, if somebody came into the shop and put down a triple nine fine gold maple, uh, let's say a newer, whatever, four nine maple, could be anything, 2010, but doesn't, the year doesn't really matter. And then one of those five nine wildlife series, we're actually going to take the four nine maple and pay more for that than we would for the other two. Or, or again, if you built rapport with the shop, maybe, we'd probably buy the newer 4.9 Maple and that 5.9 carded one for the same higher price just because, you know, we're trying to take care of you. Right. You know? and, then, and then the triple line, of course, maybe spot or 10 bucks under or something like that. But that's because that 5.9 piece, we never really know when we're going to have a buyer come in and want that piece. Right, right. It's it's niche, and you have to find someone for it, and who knows if it sits on your shelf for a few months before you have to just discount it entirely to, to get it out of there and make some money. Exactly. What are you offering folks for fractional gold eagles, um, gold maples, and the gold bars? Um, fractional gold, whether it's in the form of the, the eagles, the maples, or, or whatever, does have a wider spread, uh, percentage-wise. Um, that's why some people don't load up on fractional, because they understand 
and and this is where this is where transparency of your local coin shop plays a huge role here. Mm-hmm. But, um, people don't always load up on fractional because it has that bigger spread built in. Yeah, that uh, premium. Carriers wider. So let's say we were to pay. Let's say we're paying spot plus. Forty dollars an ounce for a one ounce gold eagle. Well, a one tenth ounce gold eagle, we might be paying spot plus uh, one hundred and fifty dollars an ounce, and that sounds like it's a much higher premium, and it is. But you also have to understand on the sell side, we might have a sixty or seventy dollar margin here, so we'd be selling that gold eagle for like one hundred ten over. But on that one tenth ounce, we're not selling it for only two hundred dollars over per ounce. We might be selling it for maybe three hundred over per ounce. And so, yeah, we'll pay the premiums on it. But as far as like your return on investment, because of the the wider spread, just have to understand, you know, the the smaller pieces at a time, and it eats into your eats into your margin a little bit. Right, you're you're taking a hit unless gold jumped up a bunch. Right. Okay, so I warn people about buying the gold backs and the silver backs, especially when they don't live in a state that accepts them as payment. Are you guys buying gold backs? Uh, we're only buying them with the intention to uh, flip them on eBay. Uh, occasionally, if you walked in and we had some, we maybe have a few on display. Um, <laughs> we, we're not, none of us in the shop actively enjoy the product. We're not, we're not keeping them for ourselves. We're not investing in them ourselves. And uh, we definitely don't encourage people to buy them either. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Cause so. if we were talking about the fractional gold being a huge spread, these are even more so. Very much so. Very much so. I think it's a neat concept what they've done. Uh, using technology to do this gold interwoven into the note, and it's cool, but it's also dabbling on the lines of kind of going into your your modern niche collectibles market, and it's yeah. really starting to gravitate away from just your core basic investing in the metal because of those high premiums. Yeah, it's more of a novelty. Exactly. What are some common misconceptions you feel float around about coin shops and selling? Uh, this is kind of a weird one. Uh, folks these days don't really know how to communicate with a live person in front of them anymore. <laughs> and, and so every time we buy from a new customer, the material they purchased is usually from one of these larger online dealers, mm-hmm. you know? And we always ask them, hey, why didn't you consider buying it from us in person? You know, when you first, it's got to be some kind of cultural thing now. A society just wants to, they love the convenience to just add it to a shopping cart and click click a button and be done. And it's really kind of, I, I think the misconception is like they're not, they think maybe a coin shop isn't going to be fair to them or, you know, oh, a coin shop, they're going to, they're going to offer me under spot. And it's like, I don't understand where some of these misconceptions even derive from. Cause these are coming from folks that have never even been into a coin shop. Right. They probably heard it from somebody as like a rumor. And then exactly. they just, they keep perpetuating that rumor, even though they themselves have never even stepped foot in a coin shop. Exactly, exactly. See, that that's a good point. And one of the things that I thought of before I stepped into your shop, because I had never stepped into a coin shop until I went to Avenue Coin, was like, all these shop owners are grumpy old men. And I, when I went to Avenue Coin, I was very surprised that not only were you guys not grumpy, but you weren't old. <laughs> definitely not old, definitely not men. Yeah, you know, there's, yeah. You know, there's... Uh, there's you know, mixed, mixed, uh, mixed race, mixed sexes, uh, coin shop owners. It's it's all over the board. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, different ages too. I mean, you have us. We have a full staff. Um, 
you know, another neighboring coin shop in another town is, you know, she's, you know, a Hispanic gal. She's in her 30s. She's doing just fine owning that shop, running it on her own. So. Mm-hmm. And yeah. great customer service, too, I'm sure, with everything. Cause Absolutely. With Absolutely. you guys as well. Uh, going back to the Silver Seeker video, what was the biggest takeaway that you had from it? Because I, I know I'd sent it to you, and I was like, oh, okay, I'm kind of curious what your thoughts are here. What was interesting, that was, uh, that was a video where he was just kind of calling up all these uh, different different coin shops and, and, and getting their, you know, what would they be willing to buy his you know, assortment of one ounce gold coins for. Yeah, yeah. And I think the shops were in his area. I don't think they were national. So I think it was very region specific, uh, probably uh, city specific. And given that he'd call in 10 shops, I'd say he was in a fairly large city. I don't think so. Or he was calling within probably like a hundred mile radius or something to that effect. Right. Maybe a big county or something like that. I don't, I don't, I remember probably the biggest thing I took away was, uh, again, going back to where it pays to shop around it, and there was some pretty decent spreads between the different offers from the different shops, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, I think (laughs) there was a multitude of shops he called, but only the last one in that video uh, was in sync with what was going on on that day or in that time period. Is when he did that video, the days that he was calling, this is back in like August, I think, of 2022. Uh, you I know, think. I want to say it was like October, October, September, October, and okay, okay. the premiums went through the roof, and spot had dropped a ton. Um, I, right. I, but at the same time, these these places were offering like next to nothing for them. Demand was through the roof and premiums were through the roof. And that, I, I remember just like, that's weird. Which which kind of, that was that blows my mind because as, as I'm not, okay, I'm officially, I'm not the owner, but I'm practically running the place, you know, but um, as a shop manager or whatever you want to call a title, if I had an opportunity to buy your gold for, you know, spot plus, fifty dollars as opposed to having to pay these high premiums spot plus a hundred or spot plus 150 i would do it in a heartbeat so during that phone call during that time period there is huge demand coin shops needed the product to fill orders and i just found it really odd how these other shops weren't on the phone they weren't willing to pony up um you know we I think we were paying like a hundred dollars over spot for gold eagles at that time, mm-hmm. um, which I, I think I think none of those shops were even close to that. No, I think a lot of them were at spot or slightly below spot, and like you said, the last one was like, "Oh yeah, I'll give you." Uh, uh, I think it was like seventy over, and it was the most. The most I don't I don't recall exactly, so forgive me if I'm wrong there, but. I was I was just blown away by that, and I, I'm not calling out Silver Seeker and saying that he, what he was doing was wrong or that he was trying to manipulate anything. It was more of just this conversation that all these shops will only offer you X amount for this. It depends on a lot of things, and demand being one of them, and it's also region specific. So his region, I feel might be offering a lot less maybe they had like a huge uh influx of gold and they didn't really need it versus like our area you needed the gold so you were willing to pay for it or maybe that region has for whatever reason maybe these shops still they need to operate on a much larger margin it's it's possible that you know in the in this one area all these shops are just in it to win it you know a lot of competition yeah, yeah, who knows? Who knows why that is? Or Anyway, and it's interesting because, like, obviously we're, you know, we're Central Valley, California. Cal- I mean, California is, you know, friggin' expensive as hell to do anything, you know? <laughs> but we've been able to, you know, try to be as competitive as possible with our, with the way we run our shop spreads. So when I was watching that video, I'm like, 
what is going on here during this time are you kidding me there was a little more that Jerry and I discussed, but that conversation really didn't fit into the flow of these two videos that well. Those topics were either a little too long to be included, and they weren't strong standalone topics. If you'd like to see a part three, and you have a question for Avenue Coin, go ahead and submit your questions to campbellscoins at gmail.com. That email address is down in the description of this video, among other things. In the subject of your email, put question for Avenue Coin. I'll compile these, and if it works out, we'll get a third video going in the next couple of months. Your time is your most precious asset, and I appreciate you spending it here with me. Thank you all for watching. This is Campbell's Coins, and that is my two cents.